as a Christian, when you think of God, when you think of justice, when you think of righteousness, when you think of holiness, do you think from what you read in Scripture, from what you know intuitively to be true, would you come to the conclusion that God predetermined all sin to come to pass just as it does for his own glory a Calvinist does not like to really use the term cause they try to create a workaround uh, bring to pass etc etc most will we'll show you a, an excerpt from uh, a video from John Popper one of the foremost respected Calvinist and I think at least one that has a, some intellectual honesty he doesn't try to sugarcoat his beliefs his beliefs actually line up with the Westminster Confession of Faith the way that it's written and uh, then we'll kind of discuss a few things to see if their view of God is of the God of the Bible or of some something else because their Calvinism is growing the insanity that it causes is growing and John Piper actually touches a little bit on that um, so let's let's see if we can play the clip and and go from there he's asked the question does god determine all things every dust molecule all the sin that easily besets us that surrounds us all that we see that would be the holocaust rape gang rape murder a husband beating his wife a man defiling a child decapitation by muslims downtown london did god cause this to happen did he bring it about sovereignly they love the word sovereign I have to respect John Piper. I disagree with him, but I will say I at least respect his honesty and how he answers because it's the only consistent answer. Has God predetermined every tiny detail in the universe, such as dust particles in the air? And then I should add here, including all our besetting sins. Yes. When you contemplate believing in a totally sovereign God, you will center it right on the cross because you'll go crazy otherwise. You will. These things have driven people mad, but it, it won't drive you mad if you say he loves me and he governed the most wicked thing that ever happened in the world, the crucifixion of my Savior and my God, if you stay right there and then just work out from there as far as your mind can handle, then you'll be safe. Your mind will be safe. Your heart will be safe because you'll keep humble. People get very arrogant with these kinds of doctrines. They can use them to club people. But if you stay with the cross... Uh, He almost speaks like a person has a choice in what they believe. That they almost have a uh, capacity to center their thoughts on the cross to avoid the insanity that God might bring to pass if they go insane from trying to adopt and contemplate reformed Calvinistic beliefs that God 
causes all things to come to pass. And what they they do, and what you'll notice, what he leaned toward in here is there's a couple of events in Scripture that we know that God did bring to pass a certain way because the scriptures tell us that he did. The two that come off the top of my head is uh, the crucifixion, that God brought that to pass, and Joseph being sold into to slavery. So those declare God working in that to bring that to be no argument with those events whatsoever <clears throat> the issue comes about when they add to the scriptures their own philosophy a philosophy that by john piper's own admission will drive you insane if you focus on what they say the Bible says, it will drive you mad. We know some people, anyone that's discussed theology online, in person, amongst other groups, you've met some Calvinists who, it, it honestly, and I'm not trying to be nice, the elevator seems to stop short. It's this mindset has 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 broken their ability to reason, to interpret the world around them, to read the scriptures genuinely, and to to pull from the scriptures because they read the Westminster Confession of Faith, or some other catechism, like a filter on top of the scriptures. When dealing with one, if you'll often notice, few will actually be sola scriptura, Bible alone, scripture alone. They'll profess all the solas, faith alone, grace alone, to God be glory alone, scripture alone, etc. But in practice, it's man's philosophy as sovereign in how they interpret scripture. They will tell you that you have no will in what you do necessarily, but yet you're culpable and punishable for what God brings to pass in your life. And at the same time, though God has foreordained, predetermined, pre-necessitated, predestinated, I mean, they have, they have all this lingo all these things to come to be. Somehow in their mystery box, they say God causes it, brings it to pass, yet is not guilty. That his hands are clean, though every vile thing that has ever happened in humanity, God has brought it to be. Uh, by his sovereign decree before the world was created, and for his glory. I can see the insanity, the seed, many seeds actually, that this plants in the mind of these people. If you look at John Piper, and, I'm, and it's not a really a personal attack, but listen to, listen to him. He seems very comfortable in one sense in saying God brings to pass all things, all sin. But at the same time, 
you see how he speaks to the insanity that this will cause you. And you can kind of see that he's a little shaky. That he's, that you can tell this maybe has taken its toll on him. I, I know some Calvinists. Not all are uh, totally out there. One in particular I can think of is uh, one to be aware of. He's a uh, former Waldensian, primitive Baptist, regular Baptist, strict particular Baptist, pre Destitarian Baptist, pre necessitarian Baptist, regular Baptist. Um, now a Calvinist slash Presbyterian slash whatever will be next. Uh, years ago, he came into some fellowships that uh, I'm familiar with. And me and another brother, actually several other, were like, this guy's a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. Then he changed shirts, changed labels. Um, over and over now finally it's like the skin has been shed off of uh, the sneaky snake kind of thing and now miraculously he, he came to admit the essence of what he is but that that's one of the problems I have with Calvinism is they're very deceitful Many of them, they'll try to come in and convert fellowships instead of just walking to the front door and said, hey, I'm a Calvinist. I hold to, you know, the five or six points of the doctrines of grace slash tulip. I want a fellowship with you. Few will do that. They'll come in and they'll talk Christian lingo. And in they come. And then they start throwing around all... You know, they'll use the same language and then they'll try to tweak the definitions to match what they believe. But speaking of, let's read a little bit of the good old Westminster Confession of Faith. And don't let the language intimidate you. It just shows that a lot of times you can use big words and say really nothing or very unwise things even using big words you see people it's like they're walking around with a thesaurus trying to sound smart and they talk a lot and they don't really say anything it's kind of the same scenario a lot of times here um but chapter three speaking of god's eternal decree section one reads god from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain. What they mean is, is bring to pass whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, so your will is not overridden according to them. Nor is the liberty or contingency of a second causes taken away, but rather established. Section 2, although God knows whatsoever may, may or can come to pass upon all supposed conditions. So he, he they're saying, though he has what is really to be thought of as foreknowledge. Any possible contingent decision would lead to this decision, this result, and so forth. Though he has that ability, yet he hath not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future. So it's not based on his foreknowledge, his foresight. Or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions. Section 3, by the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life, and others 
foreordained to everlasting death, hell. These angels and men, thus predestinated and foreordained, are particularly and unchangeably designed and their number so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. So you have those that say they hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. If that's true, there is no simple five points of Calvinism. There's only six points of Calvinism. The last duplicate being that God ordains and chooses, has already chosen an eternity past, who, based on his desires, his will, will go to heaven and who goes to hell. And that's it. That's the way it works. You have no say so in the matter. It's based on an unknown reason, an unknown uh, condition within God's own mind. While this comes to be, all of which, after he causes mankind to sin or be righteous, brings it all to pass for his glory somehow is not punishable or guilty or culpable for for causing all of humanity to fall and ultimately each individual sin and thought and decision that we make but that he's not guilty for any of that but with that said in turn creates for the very purpose of casting people into the lake of fire for something he made sure they did Can you see why it would drive you mad if you actually thought it through? John Piper's quivery kind of advice is to focus on the cross to keep you centered and just ignore the rest. Like you have a choice. If you focus on the cross, it's because you were ordained to decreed to do so and if you go insane likewise that was also decreed immutably but yet here we are <clears throat> so can you see the insanity in this philosophy and that's what it is it's not biblical that just looks at the text and reads the text it's this little collection of philosophy that's read over the text. Now, like in the, in the video I discussed, when describing Jesus, God, from the scriptures, we develop a truth of, of who he is. The Calvinist has a Jesus that didn't die for everyone, the Bible says he did. The Calvinist has a Jesus that makes a call that says whosoever will, whosoever desires or wants to, come to him and receive everlasting life. The Calvinist Jesus is a, doesn't do that. The Bible has a Jesus that it is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfactory payment for our sins believers but not for ours only for the sins of the whole world it's, it's a gift that has appeared to all men the Calvinist Jesus doesn't two, describing two different persons that did two completely different things likewise the Calvinist Jesus before all of eternity began partook in deciding who would go to heaven and hell unconditionally based on nothing they did nothing they would ever do 
They only accept him because he forces them to. He regenerates them so that they will believe. And then they endure in faith because he's doing the, the believing for them in essence. The Jesus of the Bible goes to the cross for the world who declared the consequences for rebellion, for sin. Not He didn't cause it, but he did forewarn the consequences and then went to the cross to offer a satisfactory way to deal with justice and offer grace. That's the Jesus of the Bible. Not the same Jesus that John Piper believes in, obviously. Not the same God that does the same things, that did the same things, that says the same things. But not just John Piper. That would be John MacArthur. That would be, well, A.W. Pink. That would be anyone that wears a Calvinistic T-shirt, you know, bought the shirt, rode the ride, have the cap, you know, the Calvinists, the Reformed, in thought. It is probably, from what I've seen, the number one trap to spiritually neuter. Typically, newborn believers that have been taught that they can take logic, reason, and even what they read, put that in a little box and set it aside, pick up the Westminster Confession of Faith and say, this is basically your Bible that you read the Bible through, and then their mind gets perverted and, and warped and twisted. John Piper, I remember uh, hearing... Quite some time ago, actually, early earlier in his faith, didn't hold to any of this, but was introduced to it, and I believe you can look it up yourself. He, like um, R.C. Sproul, many others, had a biblical view of salvation until they went off to seminary and their brains got scrambled making them forever stuck in this circular, you know, circular mindset. So modern day seminaries have been taken over by Calvinists. Many Baptist churches taken over by Calvinists. They say they have the same gospel, but do they? They have a different Jesus. I mean, I think we've shown that in many others as well. The character of God is totally different. So, do, I mean, the whole picture of God, justice, holiness, righteousness, mercy, grace, two completely different descriptions. They're crippling people. And, and Christians are allowing this. They Christians have become so lax in defending the Bible and what it says for many different reasons. Your big, uh, well-known people, typically there's going to be fame, money, um, communion with other more famous people kind of is at stake, your seminaries. Likewise, your, your other people are making compromise They'll say, well, at least Calvinists, you know, Calvinists have the right gospel, but do they? The gospel that we believe, what people want to call free grace, is that salvation is offered freely without charge. It was paid for by Jesus, presented and offered to all. That anyone can and has the ability to answer God's call for them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. 
Calvinist gospel, you can't do that. I've had one person actually try to hinder every time the gospel was presented by anybody, he would make faces, roll his eyes, start talking a bunch of silly Calvinistic lingo to try and keep people from and, and that was one of the first red flags. Um, so basically what that needs to be admitted by all Calvinists is if you hold to the legitimate Westminster Confession of Faith, God creates babies. This one elect for no reason. This little baby to grow up to some age, only God knows, for the sole purpose of pitching into the lake of fire. Now, some of you can look at all that and maybe come up with a reason why you can still fellowship with somebody that could believe such a thing and say they believe the Bible. I can't. I'll tell you now. Some will say, well, it's just semantics. No, it's not. It's, it's very much the depth of what is being said. It's not semantics. Semantics is where you try to talk around the fact you're saying God caused Adolf Hitler to murder millions of people by saying he brought it to pass or decreed it through direct and indirect means. He, you know, uh, creates the ends and the means and trying to soften that up. Unlike John Piper that says, yes, God brought that to be for his own glory. God, God, all those murders and rapes and experiments and castrations and screams and agony and pain and deprivation and injustices that occurred to those people. John Piper in a consistent Calvinist believes God made that happen. But yet isn't responsible for what Hitler did, though he caused Hitler to do it. You see why John and Calvinists, they want you to be Calvinist. But they don't want you to think about being a Calvinist because you might just leave it if you don't go insane. They talk like you have a choice. But then they tell you you don't. They talk like you have the ability to decide to focus on the cross to keep from going insane, but then they teach you that you don't. And when the insanity grows to a certain level, and it's obviously a contradiction, it's obviously problematic, you just take all that and put it in a mystery box and tell you you have to swallow that pill. No matter how bad it chokes you, to get it down. The rise of fatalism coincides with Calvinism, and there's many varieties of fatalism. You have Hindu fatalism, you have uh, Islamic fatalism, you can call it determinism. It's, it's the same thing. You have Calvinistic determinism or fatalism you have atheistic determinism or fatalism they call it fate what will be will be the only thing they do is change the first the hidden cause the underlying cause that is bringing everything to pass that you have absolutely no part in no control over but guilt if necessary um so that somebody can be blamed. It's growing. Christians are allowing this to be part of their fellowships. If you look, people like James White, for instance, he is more cordial, more respectful, and seemingly more willing to hang out with a uh, Muslim sheikh 
who has a lot more in common than he may like to admit with James White than he does somebody that says no man is responsible for all his sin. God did not force me to do that. That was, that was me. That was you. He has more in common with the Muslim than he does us. The Muslim has more in common with James White. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is easy to look up for yourself, go read it for yourself. Um, you'll hear a lot of fancy wording and, and really carefully built paragraphs and so on and so forth. But what you won't find is how it lines up with for God so loved the world, man is not guilty for his father's sin, not guilty for the son, you know, son is not guilty for the father. You won't see any of that in basically the Westminster Catechism. What you'll see is things that literally make no sense to a rational um, objective person who has any type of life experience that sees how things work. You know, you, they'll quickly say, you know, God, through his unsearchable wisdom and infinite goodness and providence and sovereignty, did this and did this and did this and did this, but yet is not guilty. And I'll tell you a good example. You know, I've, I've spoken in the past. A good, simple example of how much Calvinism has, has crept in everywhere, especially in the free grace community, is open your King James Bible. Pull it up on your digital concordance. Type the word sovereign into it. And post in the comments below how many verses have that word. I'll wait to see how many get put in there. You see, we continue to adopt words because of our interaction with the Calvinist. We continue to adopt ideologies that we think come from the Bible because of our interaction with Calvinists. Their hyper view of the fall of man and what happened after the fall is manifesting itself everywhere in Christianity and not. They don't get these ideas from scripture. They get them from people like Augustine who had brought in a particular view of original sin unique to him. That because of the curse, man became so corrupt that they couldn't even believe on God when presented with the, with the truth that your child from birth is not tainted. They're not flawed. They're not born in an environment of sin, born in sin, born in a fallen creation. Not that your, your baby has the uh, ability to do right or wrong to understand right or wrong, to lean a little toward the corrupt side. But that this baby is born a God-hater and grows up a God-hater and stays a God-hater until God gives them new life, regenerates and ultimately thus saving them so that they can believe 
and so and and things you just do not see in scripture and you do not experience in the real world in reality but augustine introduced this gnostic framework long ago and with the rise of calvinism has risen the acceptance of such ideas you know there's the talk of all the rep you know rep uh, paying back stumbling over my words of slaves from a few centuries ago a few decades ago it just it wouldn't been thought of common sense common logic Justice, the understanding of justice and righteousness, culpability, makes known you are not responsible for your great, 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 great grandfather to fix his mistakes, to bear his guilt. You may be cursed by his actions. You may be affected. Your future changed from what it could have been. None of which equates your guilt for what Robert E. Lee did, Ulysses S. Grant did. This would not have come into thought. It's, it's an idea of you bearing the guilt for something you didn't do. And the thought of the Augustinian original sin versus what logically follows, biblically is shown, is not something that comes directly from scripture. There's a couple passages that they try to use to support Augustine's view of original sin. Because what I see in scripture is this same scenario, and this has helped others to see what I see in scripture when it comes to original sin, the consequences, the fallout, the curse. Say you have a prostitute she goes out sins does what she does ends up both pregnant and addicted to meth and she has AIDS she brings the baby to term the baby is born of the mother the baby is born underweight the baby is born with AIDS the baby is born addicted to meth. She is cursed. She, she is feeling the fallout and the weight of her mother's sin. Her life is affected. All of these things, she would be more likely to be addicted to meth. If she survives and the mother survives and she is raised by the corrupt thinking mother, her likelihood to sin even worse is high. But would the, a rational person, a logical person, understanding justice, righteousness, come to the conclusion that that baby bears the guilt and therefore the punishability of the mother's actions. Think about that. And if you say yes, that baby does, trying to support this view, then you have no defense against those that are willing to murder a baby saying, well, the man raped the woman. 
He committed a horrible sin, a something worthy of punishment. Now I want to abort that baby, implying that to bring justice and satisfactory payment, that baby must wear the guilt of what the father did. And I'll leave those thoughts with you because Calvinistic thought does not just affect you in the two-dimensional academic, you know, put on your suit and tie, make sure your beard's pointy, uh, world. It starts to affect your perception on everything. Is God holy? Or is he the cause of all sin? Am I guilty? Guilty for my own sin or for the sin of my great, great, greatest grandfather? Am I not only affected by his choices, but I, do I actually bear his guilt? And if that's true, then these other things to be just have to be considered in the non-theological realm. Should I step in and try to help a, a helpless person? I don't know. Was I determined to or not? Do I have a choice? Should I be good to my wife? Should you be good to your husband? Should you be good to your children? I don't know. We'll just wait and see and look backwards to see what happened. And that'll be ultimately the decree of God of what should have happened. Because that's what he brought to pass. The world is... is has left reality. And I think that plays a big part of it. People don't do much physical things anymore. Unless they're burning down cities, of course. That's how you keep a virus away. Is lots of burning buildings, I guess. But I won't get off on that. But in scripture, you see, to me, I, I'll... I, I could go on and on and on and on about the problems of Calvinism and why Christians should have enough backbone if they believe that God is holy and just and that man is at fault for man's sin. They should put some safe space between them and Calvinists. But the earliest event of which, by the way, if you'll read in the Westminster Confession of Faith, God calls to happen, which is the fall of Adam and Eve. There's some interesting things that you can glean just from the account. So go back and read Genesis 3, 4, and 5. Just kind of get the whole big picture. Read Genesis 2, 3, 4, and 5. God told Adam and Eve what exactly when it comes to the consequence of eating of that tree. What did he say would happen? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof inside that day, that you eat of it, thou shalt surely die. Most come to some agreement or accord that this would be the spiritual death, the, the, the cutting off from God, being dead in sin and trespasses. And that's plural when you read Ephesians. So please help people not say sin and trespass. 
its sins and trespasses in Ephesians. That's another thing that people uh, seem to trip over for some reason. You get into chapter 3. Eve is beguiled by the serpent. Adam by Eve. And when the woman saw the th uh, chapter 3 verse 6 when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her, her husband with her and he did eat she ate he ate what did God say would happen within the day so in the day that you eat thereof you'll what die and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Skipping down to verse 9. And the Lord called, the Lord God called unto Adam, said unto him, Where art thou? And, and he said, So this, this spiritually dead being, Adam and Eve, they had sinned. <clears throat> they had fallen heard the voice of God calling to him and he Adam said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself and God's replying and it says and he said who told thee thou was naked Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, here's the, the, the question. God knew that they had eaten. He's not asking for confirmation as far as him not knowing. He's asking for a confession. And the man said, enter Calvinism. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. So whose fault is it? He points back to God. Obviously from the text, whose fault is it? Adam's. The woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, so he looks to Eve, her turn. What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Who made the serpent? God. You see in the connection between the refusal to accept personal responsibility and Calvinism? Now let's see how that played out. Did God say, it's my fault? I made you do this. I brought this to pass through means unbeknownst to you, and I caused you to fall for my own glory. You don't get any of that idea from the actual text. It has to be read into it. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, you have sinned. Thou hast done this. Thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. Look how this is individual singular pronouns. Thou, thou, thou. And dust thou, thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and to the woman he said I will greatly multiply thy sorrow singular particular punishment for the individual sin for what she did and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children in thy singular 
desire shall be to thy singular husband, and he shall rule over thee. Singular. All this is a verdict rendered specifically to Eve for her actions. And unto Adam he said, Because thou had hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, so it's a personal, it's God speaking directly to Adam for his sin. Cursed is the ground, or which I have commanded of thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow. Shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. They sinned. After which... They were dead in sins and trespasses. In the day thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt surely die. After sinning, after the fall, they were able to hear God when he called, communicate and speak back to God. They had the ability. It was not gone after their sin. They had a punishment placed upon them. They had a curse put upon them. It affected all of humanity. God expelled them from the garden cutting us off from our creator but it did not in any way change their ability to answer when called neither does our fallen nature our corrupted being our inherited uh knowledge of good and evil our less than perfect demeanor our inclination towards sin leave us with any excuse of saying that we're unable totally unable they say total depravity but they mean in unable to respond to the truth of the gospel from the to the call of god you don't see that in scripture that is read into the scripture that is read into the seminaries through the Westminster Confession of Faith through Calvin's writings Augustine's writings Beza's writings A.W. Pink's writings not from the Word of God it leaves them a perfect and great excuse to never grow up if they get saved they always have God or Adam to blame. And that's why they will, people like minded will flock together, and you're seeing the effects of it everywhere. Look around and tell me I'm wrong. So, if you're a Calvinist, I pray that the Lord will bring you out of that, and the Bible will begin to make sense again. If you're not a Calvinist, I pray that you will be on guard because many are sly, sneaky, deceitful, and willing to pretend to be whatever they need to pretend to be and put on whatever hat is necessary to fill it, to have you accept them enough that they can help start shaping your mind or like the picture the pigs up will be down down will be up your mind on Calvinism just as John Piper said when you paint this picture of a God that brings all these evils to pass and all the other packages that comes with Calvinism you'll need some point to focus on and ignore everything else in the world or it'll drive you crazy and it'll drive you mad and you can keep that stuff away from you and avoid it and just stick with reading the Bible let it tell you what it says or you can fall into the trap And around the merry-go-round of no sense. 
you may get stuck until your last breath is taken. So be, be careful. Be vigilant. There's many, many things around us that would love nothing more than to spiritually stunt you right where you are now and forever. Because if you've trusted Jesus Christ, you are his and his forever. But if you can be taken out of the game, taken out of the fight, taken out of the war, taken out of the action, that is exactly what the enemy would love to see happen. So, stay in your Bible, keep your guard up, and to stay sane, focus on the Word of God, which points you to Jesus Christ, the person, the love of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, and let this be the light and lamp that paints your way to a very, very uh, confusing world at times. This is your anchor. It's not Calvinism. It's not all these other isms. It's the word of God that you need. Trust it and take it for what it says. And stay away from all these man-made philosophies and, and that'll really, really help you. So... Till next time, please take care. Be vigilant. Really, be vigilant. Now's not the time to let your guard down. Until next time, take care and God bless.